and welcome everybody here in Twitch chats and everybody on YouTube for our last section of our Theros Beyond Death complete set review. We're talking about all 254 cards, even though I guess five of them are basic lands. So I guess we're not really talking about those ones too much. But yeah, we're talking about each card, giving them an in-depth analysis on how they could be used in standard and also what kind of impact they could have on the format. Uh, we are on our last section with the multicolor cards and artifacts uh, together. So this is this is usually the longest section. Um, this is the most cards, plus these multicolor cards, a lot of them are, are um, uncommons and rares, and they're probably uh, going to be a little bit more interesting to talk about. Um, so yeah, let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and get to it. If you missed any of the other cards, hope you check those out. But yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about these cards for standard. I guess I should say that. Um, and we're also going to be giving each card a letter grade in standard. Um, if you For the um, for the scale, uh, for those of y'all in chat, you can hit exclamation point grade for the link. For those of y'all watching on YouTube, go down to the description down below. That was the word I couldn't think of last time, description. And there's going to be a link to the... Uh, grading skill there but since I read through it with some of the other colors earlier we won't read through it here and so yeah the ratings are Hawkeye approved okay so Acolyte of Affliction two black and a green for a 2-3 when Acolyte of Affliction enters the battlefield put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard then you may return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand so we can kind of compare this to Golgari Find Broker, which Golgari Find Broker is also four mana and is a three four, and also returns a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. However, Golgari Find Broker is really difficult to cast, being black black green green. Acolyte's a lot easier to cast, being just two green black, and also it mills yourself two anyway, so you get to to give yourself a little bit more card selection by milling yourself two. So honestly, I kind of feel like Acolyte of Affliction is going to be played a little bit more in standard than Golgari Fine Broker, because I think that, that that ease of casting is really important. Uh, Fine Broker does give more devotion. That is true. Um, but I think this ease of cast, I think you can easily play this. I think you can more easily play this in the three color deck. So maybe you play it in like an Abzan deck with Charming Prince that gets to flicker it or in a in a soul tie deck with Thassa that gets to flicker it. <laughs> nope, no, no new codes. Um, yeah, it's been a long time since they've got new codes. But um, but yeah, so I, I, I kind of feel like I, I like this a little bit more than, so if we think about like, yeah, Fine Broker is not really played at all because it's just too difficult to cast. But so I think this could see play a little bit. Um, but I'm gonna give it a C. I think this is just a, I think this is a solid card. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give it a C. I'm gonna move this over here also for now, make it easier. Okay. Allure of the Unknown, three black red sorcery. Reveal the top six cards of your library. An opponent exiles a non-land card from among them. Then you put the rest into your hand and then that opponent may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Huh. So it's this is risky. You know, this is really the unknown. Um, you know, it's it's five mana draw five. That sounds awesome. But however, it's also five mana. Your opponent gets to look at the top six cards of your library and cast the best one without paying its mana cost for free. Yeah, that's that's pretty rough. Um yeah so as far as like what to really do with this card um the one obvious thing to, to do with it is with um teferi if you can play this with three mana teferi then then your opponent doesn't get that card because they can't cast instants they can't cast you know spells besides when they could cast a sorcery so that's one thing um what if you play it in like that the dryad ramp deck that we're just kind of talking about like with you know, ways to get a ton of spells in hand. Maybe, you know, your opponent does get one, but you get to just, you know, grab five cards. Um, I don't know. That still doesn't... I don't know. Maybe. Um, 
No, no, the opponent plays it right then. It's like the opponent just casts it right then. Um, yeah, so this is this is kind of a, a janky build around card kind of thing. Um, maybe they they grab a creature and then you drop a Tristani that they don't know about, then you get your creature back. Um, so yeah, it's five mana. Look at six cards. Your opponent gets to play the best one. They get to choose whatever the best one is and play that, whichever one they don't want you to play. And then you get to put the rest of them into your hand. Um. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yeah, because it's 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 that... Cre they may cast that card, right? Exile card without paying its mana cost. That's part of the resolution of the spell. Um, that's part of the, the spell getting... I don't. I don't think they can play it later. I mean, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I. I would think they would just be able to play it right then. I. I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah. Next. All right. Well, let's. I'm gonna give it a D. It's not. It's not completely unplayable. It's not an L, but it, it takes a lot of work and everything. We're. We're just gonna give this a D. That it has some upside though. Maybe somebody breaks it and it turns out to be really good. I mean, obviously, like anytime you could have a card be a five for two, basically, that's still you're you're coming out ahead. Um, yeah, if you put it if you put it in a deck with just all like one mana cards that you don't really care that they get one because it's not very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, D plus, maybe maybe even better. It has it has a lot of potential. All right, um, next card: Ashiok Nightmare Muse, three blue black five loyalty planeswalker, plus one. Create a two three blue and black nightmare creature token with whenever this creature attacks or blocks each opponent exiles the top two cards of their library. Minus three return target non land permanent to its owner's hand then that player exiles a card from their hand and minus seven you may cast up to three face-up cards your opponents own from exile without paying their mana costs so yeah this is a pretty decent planeswalker but i don't think that the, i don't think that ashiok is like too special but i think it's just a a, a pretty solid planeswalker um, as far as five mana planeswalkers go, like, yeah, I think this is just kind of pretty solid. Like, so the plus one, you get a two, three, uh, which that's good. It's like, is, is two, three better than drawing a card? Like if it, this had plus one draw a card, then they exile two cards from their library. I don't know. I don't know if like, you know, your random cards, like, you know, more valuable than a, a zero mana two, three, um, probably not. Uh, so, you know, like that's, that's a pretty good plus one. The minus three it bounces a permanent, and then they exile a card from their hand. So you know it's it's if you kind of think of like playing Teferi and go Teferi bounce, then you draw. It's like Teferi bounce, and then they exile. So instead of you draw, they exile. Um, it's kind of like that. Like that's kind of the play pattern to it. You'll see it's kind of similar to that that three mana Teferi, um, in a way. Um, but yeah, it, it's basically like yeah dispersal. Um, and then, uh, you know, that the minus seven's pretty good if you can get to the minus seven. But, you know, you play Ashiok, you, you tick up, you're at six already. Tick up again, you're at seven. Um, yeah, it's it's fine, but it's not, it's not spectacular. Um, if you kind of kind of think about like the six the six mana walkers, like Liliana and Ugin and stuff like that, that you tick up, make two twos. Think about like how impactful that is on the battlefield. This is basically the same of like five mana. You tick up, you make two threes, but you're you're not like drawing cards when they die. Like with Lilian and Ugin, you're drawing cards when they die. You're not doing that. You're only just exiling cards from their library. So it's definitely worse in that respect. I mean, so it's okay, um, but it's not going to be like oh man, we're going to start like this is the card that makes you know Demir control awesome or Esper control awesome. It's it's. It's a fine planeswalker, but it's not um, absolutely amazing. So, what if you combine it with the three mana Ashiok? I mean, all it does, all that does, is make the minus seven better. It doesn't really affect anything else. Um, 
So yeah, uh, rating, yeah, like a B. Yep, I think a B is a good a good rating there. Um, Carl, see, a good mass standard playing a support role. You know, it's kind of like a Realm Cloak Giant or a Tor brand. You know, like decks are playing it, play a couple. Yeah, it's a B. All right, Atreus, Oracle of Half-Truths. Two blue black, three two menace. I mean, it is. I mean, it's a powerful card, but like five mana planeswalkers are powerful, and that's just kind of how it is in standard, and it's there. All right, so two blue black, three two menace. When Atreus enters the battlefield, target opponent looks at the top three cards of your library and separates them into a face down pile and a face up pile. You put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. I love this card. That is a really, really cool ability. You know, it's we got a three-two menace for four. That's not the, that's not a very good body. You know, we're talking about like a two toughness is, is kind of rough. Um, menace. I mean, are we like menace is something that you want to be more aggressive or a blue black deck that's like dealing with card advantage? But just like this card is just really cool. This is an awesome card for Thassa to blink. Um, an awesome card. <clears throat> for um charming prince to bleak a cool card to go grab with like uh prime speaker vanifar and everything i like enter the battlefield effects this is this is definitely my kind of card um but yeah and it's also kind of tricky you got the you got the game of a face down pile a face up pile um you know like that's that's a pretty that's you know that's a pretty sweet little game inside the game there of like what to give the opponent and like everything um you know, maybe sometimes you give them like the better pile face up and but you know make them think that the better pile is going to be face down and they take that kind of thing. I don't know. It's a, it's a cool little yeah, it's a fun game. Like this is just a this is just a really really well designed card, a fun card to play, a card that all the green ramp stuff that we talked about last color is all going to go way over the top of this and and I'm going to be sad, but this is definitely a fun card to play. I like it a lot. Anyway, as far as like a rating, as far as like how good it actually is, um yeah you put two good cards face up and one land face down and they're like man what's the card that you put face down it's got to be something great you gave me a land and a serviceable card face up and then down underneath you just put a land but they probably think it's a lot better card so they take the face down card and it's just a land yeah pretty cool little mind game with this thing uh yeah let's give it like a b plus just because i yeah let's go b plus you're gonna do face down always. Yeah, the yeah the opponent like when you're the opponent, you make the piles. Yeah. So. Um. <clears throat> All right, bronze hide lion. Uh, green and a white for a three three. So two mana three three, and it's green and a white. So it's Lesnia. I'm all about that. It's a cat. I'm all about that. That's awesome. Uh, you you can pay a green and a white to make bro Bronze High and Lion indestructible. And whenever Bronze High and Lion dies, you return it to the battlefield. It's an aura enchantment with enchant creature you control and has green and a white enchant creature gains indestructible at the end of turn and it loses all other abilities. So that that the enchanted creature doesn't lose all other abilities as far as I can read this. The Bronze High and Hide Lion loses all other abilities because now it's just an enchantment aura that has that ability, as far as I can tell. Um, so yeah, this card, while I really like this card, I think this card's really cool. I'm skeptical of how well this card actually plays in standard. Um, you know, if you if you like tap out, if they play a sweeper, they kill all your creatures. This isn't going to be the second part's not going to be doing anything because there's no other creatures to bring it back to. Um, obviously, you can protect it from a sweeper by holding up the mana. Um, I want to give it an A because it's a cat. Hawkeye's over here telling me to give it an A. Um, so you can flicker the aura and get the creature back. True, if you have things that flicker auras. Um, but yeah, two mana three three is just fine. Um, so as far as like our grading scale goes, um, I like I don't think it's an A. I I think we'll go like B plus. Also here, let's go B plus. Yeah, 
Watch Wolf with Upside. I mean, I think I think I like Fle like I think this is worse than Fleece Mane Lion. Fleece Mane Lion was awesome though. I think like Fleece Mane Lion was was really good, but I think this is not as good as Fleece Mane Lion. For those of y'all that played a lot of Fleece Mane Lion. Um Yeah, and it triggers Hero Precinct one too. Alright, uh Calyx Destiny's Hand. Two green white four loyalty planeswalker. Alright, a Slesnia planeswalker. I'm all about it. What do we got? Plus one. Look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an enchantment card from among them and put that card into your hand. Put the rest at the bottom of your library in a random order. All right. So it looks like we may be playing more of like these random kind of kind of crappy enchantments, but we need to just play more enchantments for Calyx. That's just how it is. Because I'm definitely going to be trying some Calyx decks. Um, so we're going to be playing uh, some Calyx. I can't really zoom. This is about as much zoomed in as it really gets. I'm sorry. Um, minus three, exile target creature or enchantment you don't control until target enchantment you control leaves the battlefield. Uh, I wish this minus three was better. So basically you get to turn minus three, you turn any of your enchantments that are currently on the battlefield into a banishing light. I guess even worse, you only exile creatures or enchantments. So kind of like a prison realm that yeah, so I wish that minus three was better. I wish it didn't have the, I wish it stopped with Intel target. I wish it, the, all that stuff wasn't there. <laughs> I wish that text wasn't there. Um, but then maybe it'd be too good. Uh, but yeah, um, so that's that's kind of rough. But I think it's all about this plus one. That plus one's kind of nice of getting you extra cards. There's also a minus seven, return all enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. That could be kind of cool. Um, if you get there, uh, but yeah, I think this is all about the, you, you play it and you start ticking up and you start just draw, drawing cards. Um, it has that, that minus three option if you get to it and if you want to do it, but I, that's not a great minus three option kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so there we go. There's, there's Calyx. I like it a lot. Um, as far as a great, I mean, obviously it can only go in, in green white decks and obviously you have to play a lot of enchantments to make it worse. So we're really uh, holding back what kind of decks it can go in. Um, I think we're gonna, I think I'm going to go ahead and just give it a B for a rating, but yeah, the, the plus one is, is really strong. I'm going to give it a B. Um, Delacos, Crafter of Wonders. One blue red for a 2-4. You can tap, add two generic mana to your mana pool. Spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. And then it also says that equipped creatures you control have flying and haste. Those are kind of some weird, some really weird abilities together. Of course, where we want to put this is with a very artifact-heavy uh, deck because being a being um, a two-mana mana creature is really nice for that. But of course, you could just play an artifact-heavy deck like with green with mana creatures if we want that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, printed for commander players. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, because there's not like that great of equipment in standard. There's obviously Embercleave, but Ember Embercleave doesn't need to give your creatures flying in haste. Embercleave just kills them. I'm going to give Delacos a D. Um, yeah, I think we're just going to go with a D. Um, yeah, Renowned Weaponsmith is similar, but only costs two mana. Yeah, not really like, not really loving it for standard. All right, Devour of Memory. Blue and a black for a 2-1. Whenever one or more cards are put into your graveyard from the library, Devour of Memory gets plus one, plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. One blue, black, put the top card of your library into your graveyard. What a cool, neat little thing. It could be kind of cool and limited. I think I'm going to just give this an L for a limited rating. Um, yeah, y'all are saying D. I could see giving this a D. Um but yeah, so basically, if you mill yourself, then you can make Devour a 3-2 unblockable creature. But if you're trying to mill yourself, you're probably not, you know, like you're you're trying to like mill yourself. You're not, not needing like the damage as much. 
I'm just gonna give it an L. Yeah, the art is sweet, and this is probably definitely this is probably a good card in limited for like the self mill decks in limited kind of thing. All right, Dream Trawler. Two white, white, blue, blue for a 3-5 flying lifelink. So we're looking at six mana for a 3-5 flying lifelink. Whenever you draw a card, it gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. And whenever it attacks, you draw a card. So when you untap, and then you can discard a card to give it hexproof until end of turn. So whenever you untap with this, draw a step, now it's a 4-5. Go to attacks, you attack, trigger, draw another card, now it's a 5-5. Five, five. So it, it attacks as a 5-5 five, five flying lifelinker. Um... And you can you can kind of give it pseudo hexproof, or I mean you can give it hexproof, but you know you do have to tap it. So you don't get to black like, block with it. Also, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a, this is definitely a cool card. This this could be a sideboard card for blue white control against aggro decks. Also, um, yeah, I mean I, I like it there. Uh, the six mana and not having an, an, a real effect. I mean I, I'm gonna give this like a, a C for like a, a fringe standard card. Um, cause it's just cost too much mana kind of thing, but it, it is pretty powerful and big lifelink creature. They also has the potential to draw some cards. It can do some stuff. I'm going to give it a C. <laughs> Attack with this after playing Gadwick for a hundred. All right. Um, enigmatic incarnation Two. two green and a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another enchantment. If you do, search your library for a creature card with CMC cost equal to 1 plus the sacrifice enchantment's converted mana cost. Put that card on the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So the good thing about this being an end step trigger is that after you play it, you do get to do that right away. If you're playing a deck full of enchantment creatures, you basically get to go... Uh, turn one enchantment creature into another. Um, you know, like uh, Prime Speaker Vanifar style. Um, but yeah, it works great with omens, of course. You could, uh, you can turn an omen, like a two mana omen into like a Satessan champion that then lets you draw more cards and everything. And it's, you know, it is a May ability. It's something you get to do every single turn. You know, so this is, you know, basically a, a pretty janky build around birthing pod kind of thing. Um, so as far as our grade here, I kind of think, I kind of think like a D, like Cauldron of Eternity, a card that you just like will rarely see in standard kind of thing. I'm going to give it a D, kind of like a Cauldron of Eternity level. Eutropia, the twice favored, one green blue for a 2 2 with constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. That creature gains flying. I'm going to go ahead and just give this one an L. I think that, um, I think that we have better constellation payoffs in green that we saw. And you don't really need to be playing a ton of Constellation payoffs because you also need to be playing, of course, your enchantments and everything. I don't think we're really putting this in any decks. So I'm going to give it an L. Galia of the Endless Dance. Red and a green for a 2-2 haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random. If you do, draw two cards. This is a pretty good card. Pretty good card. Two mana, two two haste. Uh, that's just fine. Um, we do have like a, a the red black two mana, two two haste that has some upside that doesn't really see that much play. And honestly, like there are, I guess, like the more that I think about, there are a decent amount of two mana, two two haste in standard that uh, don't see a ton of play. Obviously, if you have more satyrs, that's really where you're going to be uh, seeing this. Uh, Seeing this have more value, the more satyrs you're playing. Um, but it has a little bit of upside there with that discard a card at random, draw two. Um, you know, you you get to, you know, you get to like play cards that you don't want to discard kind of thing and kind of get it down to like where you're discarding something that you don't really mind. Um, but yeah, I think I think I'm gonna call it, give this just a C. So I'm gonna just give this some C.
Hactos, the Unscarred. Red, red, white, white, a 6 1. Hactos, the Unscarred, attacks each combat if able. When it enters the battlefield, choose two, three, or four at random. Hactos has protection from each CMC other than the chosen number. So basically, this is going to be a card that has protection from almost everything. You choose two, three, or four at random, and Hactos does not have protection from that CMC. Has protection from basically everything else. So like, let's say they chose two. So then only creatures, let's see, let's say choose two shows up so only creatures with cmc2 can block this only creatures with cmc2 can do damage to it if if you block if you have this block something else of course it does have to attack each combat so that's kind of hard but then only removal spells that cost exactly the half cmc of two can target hactos um so basically yeah hactos will be almost all unblockable except for by that um, and then of course if you can pair hactos with some removal so, you know, you can kill their creatures that cost two, for example. Then again, only their removal spells that cost two can target this. Um, how does it choose if it's random? In paper, you you would roll a dice and you just roll like, like one and two would be for two, three and four would be for three, and five and six would be for four kind of thing. As far as like on arena, it will just give you an, a number randomly kind of thing. Um, with... With Hushbringer, Hactos, has protection from everything, I guess? Because he wouldn't do this ETB effect, so then it would just have protection from everything. No? Because it's, it's an as it enters, so it's not, it's not an enter the battlefield effect. Okay. Because it's an as it enters. Oh, oh, wait. If you cheat in Hactos, he is vulnerable. Correct. You cannot Ember Cleave Hactos because it has protection from six. So that means you you can't target it either. So you, you cannot Ember Cleave Hactos. If you're playing your own like pump spells or protection spells, like you can't God's will in your Hactos because it's protection from one. Um, Stomp Stomp would get Hactos if if the chosen number is two. If the chosen number is three or four, then you cannot Stomp Hactos and so on. So honestly, this card is, is really good. So yeah, it's not it's not a trigger. It's just as it enters, you choose. Yeah. So it so um because it's an as enter. So basically Hushbringer doesn't affect this card. So yeah, anything that costs one, Hactos always has protection from. Anything that costs five or six, Hactos always has protection from. No, Embercleave is always six CMC. No, it has protection from zero. No, tokens can't kill it. It only has, it can only be dealt damage by or like be blocked by things of just the one CMC that you choose at random. Um, I mean, well, the, the white part gives it the protection and you know, like the red part is like the, the whole 6-1 part. So yeah, uh, some sweepers kill it. Like Deafening Clarion would only deal damage, like a regular, like, destroy all creatures kill it, yes. But, like, a deafening clarion may not actually kill it. Um, so, yeah, this this is a really, really powerful card. Like, this is a definitely a card... Ooh, got hit by the tail. This is definitely a card that's going to be difficult to deal with. Hawkeye's not a, a fan of protection. Um... What do you mean, so if you cheat it, it doesn't have any protection? What do you mean by cheat it? Like, what does that mean? Like, cheat it still probably means it's entering the battlefield, right? And so, like, this says as it enters the battlefield, you choose a number. Like, how do you cheat something into play that's not entering the battlefield? Like, how, how is that even possible? Yeah, so Hush Hushbringer doesn't affect it. Oh, Lazav? Okay, so yeah, L Lazav...
copy it with spark double that that's still enter the battlefield that spark spark double doesn't affect it or like that's still the same thing uh no the white the one mana white protection spell does nothing you can't you can't you cannot target it has protection from one you cannot god's willing this it has protection from one so yeah i guess if you lazav this somehow Clarion only kills this if three is chosen. That's the only way that Clarion kills this. So Clarion has like a, a third percent chance of, to kill this. If two or four is chosen, then Clarion does not kill this because it has protection from that CMC. If you use Stomp on their face, he dies from blocking someone. That is, okay, yeah, if, if you do block with this card, but it does have to attack each combat as, as, if able. So you are attacking basically all the time. Um, I don't know if the Lazav version has protection from everything or nothing. I don't know. I don't know. People in chat, you know, are saying they need doesn't have protection from anything. But anyway, but yeah, you can use you. You know, there are definitely ways to kill it. You know, people said like Erebos's intervention because you can you basically have to choose with Erebos's intervention two, three, or four. You know, you get to you get to hone that however you want um but then yeah cry the carnarium um and then you know wrath like kaya's wrath stuff like that but still this is going to be a really difficult card to deal with however this is still a legend that costs red red white white so you are forced to play a red and a white deck to play this card so that's going to really that's going to really restrict the amount of play it can actually see so i'm going to give it a b because of like the the restriction in play but this is a quite a powerful card quite a powerful card if no number is chosen then it does not have any vulnerability that would that would make sense to me but other people are saying that it has all the vulnerability which would not make sense to me it would make sense there would be protection from everything if no number was chosen There's a Watsi tweet, if you get rid of the ETB, it gets pro nothing. Which that doesn't make sense why it would work like that, but anyway. <clears throat> anyway, that's we're not really playing this to get rid of the ETB. Yeah, yeah, Ethereal Absolution would kill it. Yep. Yeah, you just have to target its heal. <laughs> Let's go to the next card. Hero of the Nyxborn, one red, white for a 2-2. Two, two. When Hero of the Nyxborn enters the battlefield, create a 1-1. One, one. So that's pretty cool. So we're paying three mana. We get a 2-2 two, two and a 1-1. One, one. That's good. And whenever you cast a spell that targets hero, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So this is just like a whole lot of cards that we've seen that uh, that we've talked about with this this set. There's This ability is on a lot of cards. Cast a spell that targets the card, then all your creatures get plus one, plus zero. This is a 2-1 and a 1-1, one, one, so it's 3-3 three, three worth of power and toughness spread across two bodies. Um, <clears throat> which, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, as far as the card, I think I'm going to just give it a C. Um, you know, it, it does also get your enchantment creature buffs as well. But, I mean, that's, uh, that's not a... Um, yeah, you know, it's not like a super powerful card or anything like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure if Feather wants this either, honestly. Actually, I'm just going to go with the D plus, actually. Let's go D plus. I don't, I don't really expect that to see too much play. All right, let's move on. Clothos, Clothos, God of Destiny. One red, green, indestructible, four, five. So another god. As long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven, Clothos isn't a creature. And uh, so this this counts both red and green. So like this this has two devotion to red and green. So you need five other devotion to red and green. You know whether it's red or green. You know whatever combination, you need five other. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land card, you can add red or green. Otherwise, you gain two life and Clothis deals two damage to each opponent. Whenever this card was previewed, people were really going crazy about this card um yeah a yeah death right shaman rebalanced kind of 
I'm not so sure about it. Um, the fact that it's a three mana card definitely, definitely good. Um, you know, if you can get some get some lands in your graveyard, it's not like super easy to get lands in your graveyard, especially when you're playing like a gruel deck. Like if you think about like what what kind of gruel decks want this, like gruel devotion decks, it's not like real easy to get lands in your graveyard. There's obviously a few ways. You know, you got like your fable passage, and you know there are some cards that you can you can put some cre some uh, lands in your graveyard, but it's not like the easiest thing. Um, I guess you're exiling card from any graveyard, of course. So you know your opponent's graveyard too. But then, yeah, you get to just kind of exile other cards in their graveyard, you know, exile like their um, their creatures that or like just their cards with escape. They can come back. You get to exile those and then you get to gain life. They they take damage. Um, you know, it's definitely I'm not saying this is a bad card, but I'm I'm just I'm not sure that this is going to be like a, a slam four of and, you know, in different archetypes, a kind of thing. Um. So yeah, I'm not I'm not so sure about this one. Like basically, I'm, I'm not sure this is a. I mean, this is definitely a good card and a playable card, but I'm not sure this is like an A four of in multiple decks. Um, so I could definitely see like giving this like a B. So a like, good amount of standard play and a support role kind of thing. I I'm gonna give this a B, but this could be a card that I'm underrating a little bit. <clears throat> I'm gonna give it a B. Yeah, yeah, that would deal four damage with with uh, Torbrand. Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. All right, one thing, one thing also that I want to say that I noticed. All right, so mythics that are multicolor. Look at the look at this. We have blue, black, green, white. Like, this just doesn't seem basically what my point is this doesn't seem very balanced but anyway blue black green white green red red black green black green blue six of them did you did you notice what word i said a lot out of those six definitely said a lot of green out of so there's six of them there's green blue green black green red and green white Four of them are green. How is that balanced? You get four green. You get... I guess there's three red. No, two red. Two red. Um, three black. One white. <laughs> yeah, so one white, two red three black, three green, or uh, four green, and two blue. Green and black, the two strongest colors in, in the set, also have the most, um, the most mythic multicolor cards. White gets one. One. Red only two. White, white. Uh, I wish they would just print good red-white cards. You know, just just give us something a little different. I mean, I guess we get Hactos, but like that's so difficult to cast. They're like, all right, your red white card is going to be like impossible to cast, and it's not going to give you card advantage. <laughs> Ugh, just all all green. All right, anyway, Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, uh, red black for a six six. Elder Giant, when it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. Also, when it enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card. Then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses three life. And has that escape cost for four. Um, this is kind of some weird wording. Each opponent discards a card. Then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card. We have like the double negative there. The didn't and then non-land. Um, so why didn't it just say like each opponent discard each, dis, each opponent who discarded a land card loses three life. You could kind of think of it that way, but the reason why they didn't 
the reason why they had the wording there is because if you would say each opponent that discarded a land card they lose three life that means you know they discard a land card but with this wording saying they didn't discard a non-land card that means they either discarded a land or they didn't have any cards in hand um or they didn't have any cards in hand and they couldn't discard anything and so basically even if they don't get to discard anything because they don't have any cards in hand they they're still losing three life uh yeah when this is yeah with Hushbringer you can turn this into a two mana six six but then of course you're playing a, a mardu deck um we talked about how red white is not like the best color combinations but yeah if you you want to play like a, a mardu deck with Hushbringer, um yeah you can turn this into a two mana six six that would still trigger when you attack you'd still trigger whenever you attack with it um yeah i mean that that could definitely be a thing you definitely have a, a, a mardu deck with Hushbringer in this get some um you know get some kunaros in your deck and um tajik tajik and Hushbringer work very well together make you know growing Hushbringer. um so yeah you still get the attack trigger um so is this card good enough like how is this play whenever you don't have when you don't have Hushbringer in play and you have to sacrifice it so you're saying two mana, discard a card, and maybe lose three life. That's not very good. You know, just two mana, discard a card. That's not very good. Even if it's two mana, discard a card, they lose three life. Now we're kind of talking. Now we're kind of talking. Um, but then, of course, of course, you do have the escape to bring it back also. Hmm. If you have the white flicker, you can do that on cast two if you want the trigger. Yeah, I mean, you just turn the a flicker. If, yeah, having like a, the white flicker, all it would do is you'd still sacrifice it because you didn't escape it. So you just get another trigger that's probably not worth it still. Um, yeah, you can use the yeah you can use the the black creature to go search for for it and just put it into your graveyard and escape it out um yeah you, you can witch's oven you know you get to play this sack it to witch's oven make two food sure you can do that um yeah soren grabs this for minus two but then you do you just sacrifice it again whenever you soren bring it back so you're not escaping it so then you whenever soren brings it back you sacrifice it um i mean that so those aren't like amazing why would you want to sacrifice it? Because it's going to get sacrificed anyway. Um, so it does, you know, it does trigger your sacrifice things, you know, like your Mayhem Devil, your uh, Corvold, Corvold, like whenever you sacrifice stuff, this would trigger Corvold or Mayhem Devil, like that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's pretty tough to, to, to honestly um, really evaluate how this thing's going to play. Um, I'm not, I mean, I think it's, yeah, L Lazav. I mean, yeah, sure, Lazav, yeah, Lazav copies it very well if you want to go Grixis. I think it's going to play okay. You know, like, just the whole discard, there's two mana discard a card is, is not terrible. It's not terrible, but it's not, it's not amazing. Um, I think B is a pretty safe bet too. It is legendary. Can't have a lot of him in play. Um, I could see going B plus. I'm kind of like between B and B plus, honestly. Um, so for six mana plus, you have to have five other cards in your graveyard. But yes, six. But yeah, when you replay it, they discard two cards. Maybe they lose like three life, um, and you get you get the six six. It's not like super difficult to deal with six sixes, but then of course they do have their attack triggers. If you can have like a perforos or any you know like ways like Samit ways to give your creatures haste, that's pretty nice. Also, I'm I'm gonna go with like a B plus. That's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna go B plus. Yeah, good with Midnight Reaper. Get that extra card draw. 
I mean, basically, if you have Midnight Reaper, you turn it into Disinformation Campaign kind of thing. Yeah, because, yeah, you're not really getting this on turn four because you have to exile five other cards from your graveyard. So, yeah, you're not really bringing this back on turn four. Um, sets released on the 16th. All right, Kurinos, Hound of Athreos. One white, black for a 3-3 legendary hound. It has Vigilance, Menace, Lifelink. Has three heads. One's vigilant, one's menacing, one's life linkian. Creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. You probably don't want to put this in your Croxa deck, I guess. Because <laughs> your creature cards can't enter from the battlefield. You can't escape from the graveyard, Croxa. You are there forever. Um, also, players can't cast spells from graveyards. So you can't cast your Croxa. Or anything like that. Yep, it's the dog. It's the dog that eats the cat. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, Questing Beast, little brother. Um, yeah, Kuranos is, is a good. Good. This is a very good, solid card. Uh, definitely works in, like, a Hushbringer deck. I mean, I guess if you want to put this, play this with the Hushbringer deck in your Mardu Hushbringer deck. But it doesn't really work with your escape creatures. Um, but, yeah, 3-3, three, three, Vigilance, Men Menace, Lifelink. You know, so it doesn't have Death Touch, so it's not really trading up. But it's difficult to block, and you get to attack with it a lot with it having Vigilance. Uh, good card, good 3-drop for Soren to bring back. Um, you know, just a, a pretty solid 3-mana card. Um, it's really good against Cauldron Familiar, but like how like how good is this going to be? You know, like basically, you know, it does help shut down all the escape stuff. We've seen in, in this set... Some different removal that's been like two mana removal that like minus three, minus three, like where that three point of toughness can can kind of uh, where this can kind of hold Kuranos in check with the three, uh, the three toughness there. Yeah, I like it in Abzan Hero. Yep, absolutely. Yep, like this with Abzan Hero for sure. Um, I guess it's not great with Soren whenever you have Soren and this in play, then Soren can't bring back anything else. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, doesn't have A plus synergy with Kethis, because then Kethis isn't allowed to cast stuff from your graveyard anymore. So yeah, maybe not. Um, if you have both of them in, the, in play at the same time, you can't play anything else. So yeah, like it, it hurts a lot of other black white stuff that people want to be doing in black white. But then it's also good against other black white stuff that other people are doing. Um, hmm. I think I think this play, I think this card is probably going to play a lot worse than Questing Beast. I think a lot of people kind of see this as like a similar type of card as Questing Beast. But I think this plays a lot worse than Questing Beast. Questing Beast is is just incredible. And I, I don't think Kurunos is on the Questing Beast level at all. Um, I think Haste, you know, like the basically the abilities that that Questing Beast have are more valuable than the abilities that Kurunos has. Um and the things that Kurunos shut down are in the same color combinations for the most part as Kurunos. Um no, this is definitely a main deck card. No, yeah, you definitely could put, play this in the main deck. But I think I'm going to give it like a B plus. I think that's what we're going to go with with this card as well. Another B plus. Mischievous Chimera. Blue and a red for a 2-2 flyer. Whenever you cast your first spell during your opponent's turn, Mischievous Chimera deals one damage to each opponent. Scry one. Pretty decent little card. You know, just a... So for a two-mana card, you get a 2-2 flyer. You get to do some damage and scry on their turn. It's not bad. It's not It's not amazing, but it's not bad. A pretty good, decent little card. I think we're going to give this, this thing a nice little C+. Plus.
Um, maybe just a maybe just a C actually. I think this is kind of just a definition of a C. A fringe standard card used as filler for certain decks. Yeah, it's a good little C. Pelucranos Unchained, two black green legendary creature zombie Hydra. Pelucranos is back. Pelucranos was great whenever it was in Theros originally. So how is Pelucranos Unchained? Because Pelucranos did was killed, but it looks like it's back from the, I don't know, underworld, I guess, from the graveyard. Because it has the escape mechanic. But it also says Pelucranos enters the battlefield with six plus one, plus one counters on it. It escapes with 12 plus one, plus one counters on it instead. All right, so you're going to four mana, six, six. If damage would be dealt to Pelucranos while it has a plus one, plus one counter on it, prevent the damage and then remove that many plus one, plus one counters from it. That's a really, really bad really bad uh clause to have so that means you know it's a six six if they stomp it with bone crusher giants now it's a four four um you know it it you know gets chump blocked by a one one now it's a three three kind of thing like that's that's pretty that's a rough clause that is not something that you want to have anyway then it also has one black and green pelucranos fights up to or fights another target creature. All right, so you can use Pelucranos as a removal spell for other creatures, but of course, when you do that, Pelucranos is going to shrink. Um, so that you know, like that's, but it is removal. But then you're also shrinking your Pelucranos. Like let's say you you have your six six, you fight a four four. Now suddenly your Pelucranos is a two two. Um, also, it kind of opens you up. You know, if they respond by doing damage to your Pelucranos before you fight, you shrink it, and then maybe the Pelucranos doesn't actually kill your stuff. I don't know. Like that's. It's kind of tough. Um, that second ability is really, really rough. And of course, you know, you can't escape it with a 12 and make it a 12 12. For how good the cards are in green and black, for all the, the competition that you have at four mana, um, I'm not really excited to, to go jam this in my green and black decks. Um, but with the enchantment that doubles the one one counter every turn, that's it, pretty janky. I mean, yes, that would work well with it, I guess, but that's that's a lot of work, and that's like just hoping your opponent doesn't have any removal spell. Also, um, it can fight and kill beast and live. Quest? No, it can, questing beast has death touch. This prevents the damage. Never mind. But questing beast also says combat damage can't be prevented. So yeah, it can fight questing beast and kill it. Um, or does? Does, I think Beast prevents combat damage prevention. I don't know. Questing Beast has a million. Maybe it's all damage prevention. I don't know. Um, but yeah, good with the Great Henge. I mean, yes. Um, com yeah, combat damage can't be prevented. Yeah. Anyway, uh... Yeah, so I'm not not real big into this card. Um, my favorite thing about it, of course, is the fight part. But that that second paragraph, I'm not too big on it. Yeah, so Kenra's transformation makes it a 15-15. I mean, what, like after after you escape with it and then transformation it, then it's a 15-15. And it loses like the other abilities, right? Yeah, I think old old Plukernos was, was, was that. So like this and Vivian, so you're like what like like four mana vivian i mean or three mana vivian i guess either either vivian I and mean, vivian's just great with creatures but i mean the the thing is, is there's there's a lot of great four mana creatures that you can be playing like why why are we playing this one i don't know uh yeah you just need to elk it with oko um so yeah i'm not i'm not huge on this why how this doesn't die to death touch Right, because you prevent the damage, so it doesn't actually get get damaged to death touch. Right. So anyway, I'm gonna give it like a C, fringe standard card, kind of thing. I'm not very high on Pelucranos. All right, Rise to Glory, three white black sorcery, choose one or both, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, return target aura card from your graveyard to the battlefield. I'm gonna give this like a D. I mean, we we have like other reanimate effects in standard. Um, 
probably better ones, honestly. I mean, for this to for you to really play this, you really need that return target aura card. But I'm not sure if there's really the auras that that make this um, that great. So that's that's the way to make this better than the other reanimate spells is if there's a really good quality aura that's really worth you know a good amount of mana that you want to be returning from your graveyard to your battlefield. Um, I don't know if that's if that's a thing in standard. There's there's really like that card in standard. Um, but yeah, if it was just any enchantment, yeah, we we're, we're we're definitely talking if it's just any enchantment. But even like the work, the wolf aura, I don't think it's it's really like worth it to kind of build that kind of thing. But I mean, I guess that would, that's like the best one, I guess. So I'm gonna give it a D minus, uh, maybe a D or a D minus. We'll give it a D. It's not like unplayable. Like five mana reanimate a creature is not unplayable. We'll give it a D. Siona, captain of the of the Pileys. Pileus? Pileus. Pileus. I don't know. Either one of those. All right, but our captain. It's a Selesnia captain, so you, so you know me. That's that's what I'm all about. Selesnia legendary creatures. Let's see how good Siona is. So one green white for a 2-2. Two, two. So under the curve, three mana for a 2-2. Two, two. That's definitely under the curve. Um, when Siona, this is Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah, it does look like Wonder Woman, doesn't it? When Siona enters the battlefield, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may reveal an aura card from among them, put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Ugh, again, I wish this was just regular enchantments. Why do we have to deal with these auras that the auras aren't even good? <laughs> now we have to play auras. All right, whenever an aura you, be you control becomes attached to a creature you control, create a 1-1. One -one. I wish this was so much better than what it is. <laughs> it is top seven. So yeah, you're basically drawing an aura. Um, the auras aren't very good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, they're just not really good enough. I mean, maybe there are better auras in standard um, that I know of. But I'm I'm just not not in love with just trying to jam a bunch of auras um, into into this deck or like just into like the deck we want to play. So as far as like kind of looking at like our grading scale, kind of thinking like a C minus. Unfortunately, wish I could make rig that a lot better, and that's that's honestly probably worse than. Then I couldn't. Yeah, probably a really good commander. Probably good. I don't know. Maybe good for brawl. I, mean, I guess there's not the same kind of thing for brawl. But oh well, we'll go C minus. Could just be D plus. All right, slaughter priest of Mogus. Man, do you want to be a slaughter priest? That's a pretty intense job title. Like you're filling out like an application, and you know you have like your resume. You're like, what did you do? Oh, I was a I was a slaughter priest. Dang, don't want to mess with that person. All right, red, black, 2-2. Two, two. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, Slaughter Priest of Mogus gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn, and you also can pay to sacrifice another creature or an enchantment to give Slaughter Priest of Mogus first strike. This one is basically just a nail. Like, the, how, like we have some really good stuff in standard at like the for, like, Rakdos, 2-mana, this isn't getting played over anything. This is just going to be... We're just going to give this an L for limited. Hey, we got an, an aura. Is this a good aura? White and a blue for an enchantment aura. Enchant creature. When Enchant creature gets plus one, plus one, and has lifelink, and whenever this creature deals de combat damage to a player, draw a card. That's not a bad aura. That's not bad. Think about Curious Obsession. This is the, the, this is the new Curious Obsession. Um, <clears throat> Curious Obsession... You know, dealt combat damage to the player, draw a card. It only costs a single blue, which is why that was so good. This is blue one. This is a white and a blue. So you have to be playing two colors, which is really like the hindrance here. You have to be playing two colors. You got to be playing blue white. Um, it does give your creature plus one plus one, so that's kind of nice too. But yeah, so for a blue white flyer deck, this is a really good aura for for that. Um, I don't know if any 
specific cards that I talked about with white or blue will now be better because of this that I didn't mention before. Um, you know, Heliod's Pilgrim, of course, can go grab this. Uh, you know, if you're pl if we're playing Bant, Siona, or Siona can grab this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good aura. It's a good aura. Um, and yeah, lifelink means it's, it's easy to race. So lifelink means you're, it's easy to race. Um, yeah, it does not have like that, that sacrifice clause that, um, it doesn't have the sacrifice clause that Curious Obsession did. So you can sit back on defense easier with this, with having a lifelink creature. So I like it. It's a good card. Good card. Let's go with like a, a B minus or maybe a fringe standard card uses filler for certain decks. That's a C. So maybe a little, little bit better than that, but maybe not, uh, maybe not a B. So like C, C plus B minus, um, I'll go with C plus cause it, it is kind of difficult to, to fit it in stuff. Cause you do have to be a multi, you do have to be a blue white kind of aggressive deck. And so that is, does make it pretty difficult to fit it in. So I'm going to give, I'm going to go with the C plus. All right. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. One green, blue, 6-6. Six, six. When Uro enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. When Uro enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life, draw a card, then you can put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. And it escape for four and exile five other cards. Okay. Um, this is not Oko Part 2. Oko is a lot better than this card. Oko was just completely absurd. Um, but anyway, so basically this is this is a uh, growth spiral for three, right? You can kind of think of it like that. Like you're you're paying you're paying an extra mana for growth spiral, sorcery speed growth spiral for an extra mana, but you also get to gain three life. Um, but then, of course, afterwards, then you get this creature in your graveyard that's incredible that you can that has the escape for four mana exile five other cards then you get a you get to bring it back you get the six six that gains three life and has grow spiral attached to it and then also if it attacks you also get to gain three life and has grow spiral attached to it so obviously like when you actually get to escape with these Elder Giants, that's really whenever they become very powerful. But that's also that's also pretty late in the game because you do have to have five other cards in your graveyard. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is still this is still very good. Like, um, Grow Spiral is one of the best cards in Standard. And yeah, obviously you have like Cavalier Thorns and you have like other ways you get to self-mill this and just have it in, in the graveyard and then you get to bring it back. Um... Yeah, I mean it's a it's a very good card. Like that gain three life, that's a lot of life. Like that's that's really valuable. That gain three life. Um, sorry, the mic need to be farther away. Sorry. Um, so yeah, as far as like some people are saying this is like the best card in the set. This is going to get banned. I don't think that I don't think that this is going to get banned, and I don't even think this is the best card in the set. I don't know exactly what is, but I mean we've we've gone through cards that I like more than this. Um, but it is it is good. It is very good. I think that, yeah. I mean, it just like this is this is certainly a good card. Um, so I think this is probably is an A. Um, definitely no no lower than an A minus. But this is not, um, yeah, this is not like an A plus. Like Oko, Oko Questing Beast. Like I gave those like A pluses. This is not A plus. I don't think it's on those levels. I mean, well, Questing Beast is just kind of absurd as a as a card and everything. This, um, this on its own isn't as strong of a card, but this has a really good shell like the simic cards and simic ramp in standard already is really powerful and this just helps all of that stuff out there's there's just so much that you get to do with uro um 
Like if this was the, like if Uro was the exact same card that was one red white and the exact same card, this wouldn't nearly be as good and probably see nearly as much play. But the fact that it's blue green, that, that there's already so many good blue green cards and that already a bunch of blue green cards that work well with this, um, all of it put together. Um, yeah, Simic doesn't put a lot in, the, in this, the graveyard. That is true. Um, besides like the creatures that, get, that, that you know get destroyed, but then you have like your growth spirals, you have your Cavalier of Thorns, all that kind of stuff. It may be difficult to kind of escape this, but even if you don't, um, you still get like the triggers for casting creatures uh, for all the things that like care about like, you know, you casting creatures. Um, you know, it's still a creature to grab, you know, with all of your things that grab creatures, whether it's like, you know, Trail of Crumbs, Bond of Flourishing, all that kind of stuff that, you know, like look at permanence. You're still looking at a permanent even though it's kind of like a gross spiral effect. Um, yeah, like this is this is pretty good in like a, yeah, it's definitely very good in a, like the the Simic ramp decks, you know, beside like they have like the Risen Reef kind of decks, like they have like Risen Reef at three, but they didn't really have a lot of other good stuff at three. And Uro helps that out, you know, with the life gain and everything. And yeah, you can play, you can play Tamiyo self mill for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think I want to go A minus here. I I think it's either A or A minus. I think it's one of those two. Um, I think it's the best multicolor card. You know, we haven't given an, an A or an A minus yet to any of the other multicolor cards. So I think it's the best multicolor card. Um, I think I'll I think we'll go with an A. I think I'll just go with an A. But yeah, yep, Simic cards overperform because there are just so many good Simic cards. To pair them up with i'll give it an a but i think i like other a's more in the set all right then we have warden of the chained one red green for a four four trampler warden of the chained can't attack unless you control another creature with power four or greater we're going to give this an l for limited um there's just better cards that we could be playing at three mana in red green decks. There's a lot of good red green three drops, whether it's Domri or uh, Bone Crusher Giant or what's the the one that sure everybody's saying Spellbreaker. There you go, Gruel Spellbreaker. Yeah, just gonna give this an L. I mean, it's still fine and limited. It's still a good blocker. Like you know, like it's it's difficult to get through a three mana four four. And limited. I would definitely I would play this in all my green red limited decks. Alright, let's move over to our artifacts. Altar of the Pantheon. A three mana artifact. Your devotion to each color and each combination of colors is increased by one. Tap, add one mana of any color. If you control a god, a demigod, or a legendary enchantment, you gain a life. I don't think I mean, it does have like, you know, obviously it has additional text from being just a mana rock, but I don't think that that really pushes this, pushes this into being something that you necessarily want to play over other mana rocks that we have. Grading for standard. These are standard grades. But one of our standard grades is an L that we'd give just a, a limited card. I think this is a limited card. I think L, I mean, maybe it's a little bit better. You can maybe see it a little bit. I'll give it, so it probably should be a little bit better because mana rocks are kind of playable. So we'll give it like a, a D minus. Bronze sword, one mana equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus zero. It has equip for three. Cool. L. Probably a pretty decent limited card. Depends on how easy it is to equip to stuff. All right. En entrancing. How do you pronounce that? Lyre? Leary? Leary? Lear? Probably Lear. Probably Lear. This is a li limited bomb. But yeah, three mana. Uh, choose not to entamp. Lyre? Oh, it is Lyre. Okay. In the entrancing Lyre. Uh, you may choose not to untap it, and you can pay X and tap, and then tap target creature with power X or less. It doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as Entrancing Liar remains tapped. 
I don't think this is going to be good enough for standard. The only way I could see this being played in standard is if you have like an artifact deck, um, an artifact control deck, you know, kind of think of like our Demir Affinity decks that we play, where you need something that can be an instant speed answer for like a questing beast, like where you need to have like pay for, tap, tap the questing beast before it does damage to you kind of thing and like a late game like that. That's the only thing I can kind of think of. And, you know, like, so therefore it's like a target for Karn. Like it's a best of one deck, like where it's in your sideboard for Karn that can grab in like a late game where you have a lot of mana. That's about it. That's about all I can, that's about all I can, can think of. But yeah, probably definitely, probably a, a very good limited card. Um, I'm just going to give it an L for limited. Yeah, so if you... If you tap a creature and then untap it with something else, like a, a key, and then you tap another creature before um, before the first one triggers, um, I think you're still only keeping one card down. I don't think you can tap multiple creatures with it. So I, I think that the second creature will untap. Or like, yeah, the, like the first one that you do will untap, and you're only going to keep the second creature tapped. I think it will only keep one creature tapped basically. Not that impressed with the set. I mean, it's it's back to like a, a more normal power level for standard. Throne of Eldraine was pretty ridiculous power level. If you really think about how, like how already like multiple cards in Throne of Eldraine got banned and then like adventure creatures just completely dominate the format. Throne of Eldraine, and you saw the Cauldron familiar stuff, Throne of Eldraine just completely dominates standard. It, it was really ridiculous. This is not as good as Throne of Eldraine. And you can even see like my rankings like from last set. I had so many more A's and B's and stuff like that than, than I had for this set. <clears throat> All right, Mirror Shield, two mana equipment. Equipped creature gets plus zero, plus two, has hexproof. And whenever a creature with death touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature. Another L. Nyx Lotus, four mana legendary artifact. Nyx Lotus enters the battlefield tapped, but then it says tap, choose a color, add an amount of mana to, of that color equal to your devotion to that color. So if you have the, the Nyx Bloom Ancient in play and you tap a Nyx Lotus for mana, at minimum, it's adding nine mana at minimum. It's, you probably have like a couple other green stuff in play and you're probably adding like 15, 18, 21 mana. Uh, that can be ridiculous. But yeah, if you want if you want to uh, ramp even harder, here's a good legendary artifact for that. As far as like how much this play this will actually see in, in a lot of decks, I don't know. Probably not that much, to be honest. Um, it pairs well with like Kiora that you can like tap, tap it, add mana, Kiora, untap it, tap it again. Um, so you could do like some, some heavy, heavy ramp in with that. Um, no, I didn't really give a pluses in the set. <coughs> no, I didn't get really any a pluses. There's a lot of the A's that I really, really like, but, um, yeah, I just kind of gave A's. Uh, yeah. Expansion explosion. That could do, that could do something. This is, I think this is kind of like a, a fringe standard card used as filler for certain decks or a, a playable build around card. You want to kind of play build around this, but I think a little worse. I'm going to go like a C minus here for the Nyx Lotus. Um, don't have a, a real high expectation on it considering we just had Gilded Lotus and standard and didn't really do anything with Gilded Lotus. And then this enters tapped. If this didn't enter tapped, I'd be more excited about it a little bit more. All right, Shadow Spear. Some people are saying this is an A. Uh, Shadow Spear is um, show us the A's again. You can you can type you can you can type exclamation point grade. You can go to the uh, Google Doc that uh, that we're typing all the grades in. You can kind of go through them and and see what I I gave there. But of course, if you want like the longer explanation, you know, you can check out the videos on YouTube. All the other videos besides this one are up right now where you can check out like all the longer explanations of me talking about the cards. So Shadow Spear. So people are saying this is an A. Let's talk. Let's take a look at this one. I don't think I've really seen this card too much. Uh, one mana legendary artifact equipment. 
Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, has trample and lifelink. I like that. I like lifelink. And trample's good. Uh, it has equipped two. And then also you can pay one. And so like this ability, you don't have a you don't have to have like the creature be in, in equipped. Like this, you could always just pay one for this ability anytime. And so this ability is permanence your opponent's control, lose hexproof and indestructible. That's not that that valuable of a ability. There's not very much hexproof and indestructible stuff in standard. There's a little bit, but not that much. So it's not a very, very valuable um, ability. So do we want to play a, a one mana artifact equipment that we can pay an extra two mana now to equip stuff? And whenever we equip stuff there, the creatures get plus one, plus one, have trample and lifelink. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. Of course, you know, you got to have like your other creatures in play for this to do anything. Um, I don't know if this is like an A though. Um, <laughs> just all the gods. It's not like people play tons and tons of gods. And like, even if like the, I mean, it's not like the gods are going to be like everywhere. And then even if like they have a god in play, you can make the god lose indestructible. But if it's not a creature, does that even matter? You know, like, so if it's an enchantment, you make the enchantment lose indestructible. And then now you, your destroy enchantment destroys it. I don't know. Um, yeah, I kind of like this in like a, a Rakdos aggro deck. Yeah, like obviously with Rotting Regisaur, give the Rotting Regisaur trample lifelink. Like that's, Rotting Regisaur is kind of like the, the main one here. But then also like, um, uh, you know, Questing Beast. You know, Questing Beast doesn't have trample or lifelink. You got to give it the rest of the, the keywords that it doesn't have. Right? I think those are the only two. I think those are like the only two like words that are printed on any magic card that are not printed on Questing Beast. So I got to give them those. Um, yeah, you can give it to Fervent Champion for free. Like, that, this is a pretty nice card on Fervent Champion. Uh, Knight of the Ebon Legion, how you can grow Knight of the Ebon Legion so much. You can give it Trample and Lifelink. Um, you know, like, it, this is definitely not, this is definitely not unplayable, but it's not, it's not something, I don't think this is an A. It's not an A. Um, as far as a rating, I think we're going to kind of go with, like, a B more for this card. A good amount of standard play in a support role. I think maybe even a little bit lower. I think I'm going to go like a B minus for Shadow Spear. It's a cool card. I like it a lot. I I think it's not going to see that much play though, but I I will be glad if it does. If this does see a lot of play, I think that's that would be cool. Soul Guide Lantern, one mana artifact when it enters the battlefield, exile target card from a graveyard. Tap it, sacrifice Soul Guide Lantern, exile each opponent's graveyard, and then also pay one and tap, sacrifice Soul Guide Lantern, draw a card. So basically, you get to either choose um, sack it, draw a card. You know, you exile one thing and then you sack it, draw a card, or you can sack it and exile their whole graveyard. That is pretty nice. Instant speed, exile graveyard. Like that is that is definitely a nice ability. Um, this this could definitely see. A good amount of, of sideboard play for def, for different reasons whether you want to exile um these kind of cards with escape or you know cauldron familiars or or whatever or just you know play it in like an artifact heavy deck that uh can also pay one and sack it and draw a card um you know so it's kind of that kind of thing um I think we're a moderately played cyborg card is a B. I I, I kind of need to, to rename that, but that's a narrow but still regularly used cyborg card. That's where I'm kind of at here, and that's a C. Um, so maybe like a C plus. No, nah, probably just like a C. It's probably just like a narrow but regularly used cyborg card. Um, Thaumaturge Familiar. Three colorless for a 1-3 flyer when it enters the battlefield, scry one. L. Thundering Chariot, a new vehicle. Four mana, three, three, first strike, trample, haste. With only crew one. Pretty easy to crew. And it's a four mana, three, three, first strike, trample, haste. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I'll give it a I'll give it a D minus. It's not bad. Could see that being played in an artifact heavy deck. 
All right, we got Traveler's Amulet is back. I don't remember the last time Traveler's Amulet was in standard. I think, I don't know, like Kaladesh block or something. I don't remember when it was in standard, but yeah, it's a it's a one it's a this is definitely a playable artifact. Um, basically, you spend two mana, you search your library for a basic land, reveal it, put it into your hand. But you know, you get to split up that two mana. It it's good for things that that care about artifacts. Um, you know, like this, like some of these cards, like these could be some cards that I start playing in like my my artifact. Uh, affinity deck you know with um uh with the forge uh mystic forge you know yeah but i'm saying it's not okay so it's an ixalan yeah i think i'm gonna give it like a d it's not unplayable we'll get we'll give it a d but yeah it works pretty well with mystic forge you know like the top of your library is not what you want stack your traveler's amulet go put a basic land into your hand which you need more lands with uh, Mystic Forge. Mystic Forge does not play lands off the top of your library, but you also get to shuffle. You know, shuffle, reset the top of your library. So it works. It works well with Mystic Forge. I like it. All right, Wings of Hubris. <laughs> it's just, it's just like you know, like that's the kind of stuff I like. You know, Mystic Forge with Traveler's Traveler's Amulet. It's just comparing that to some of like like the green ramp that, that's in this set that, and then that's just pretty absurd. It's it's kind of it's kind of silly. Um, but anyway, yeah, the wings of hubris, yeah, that is that is pretty pretty cool uh, uh, flavor here. Um, equip creature is flying. It's two mana equipment. Equip is only one. I like that. Um, you can sacrifice wings of hubris. Equip creature can't be blocked this turn, and then you sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. It it starts flying too high. It starts flying too high. Pretty sweet. All right, I'm gonna give it an L though. Um, and then we have lands. Uh, I guess, I guess we don't really have the lands on here for the grading scale, but I mean, lands, I mean, you were basically just for the most part, um, you know, I didn't really grade the, like the temples last time. Uh, so, you know, like we have the five temples, uh, you know, like they're just A's, you know, like you're just, you're just playing the temples in your decks that, that you have the temples. I mean, I don't really need to say too much about them. You know, you know, like what the temples are all about. As far as these ones, I think that uh, Esper having the blue, black, and blue, white, like I think that basically blue control, which is usually blue, black, or blue, white, like those are the two biggest like blue control um, variants. I think that both of those love having these temples. Like blue, white control loves having Temple of Enlightenment. Blue, black control loves having this, and Esper likes having both of them. I think that's a pretty big get having both of those. Um, Gruul really focuses more on curving out. Same with Gruul and Rakdos. So they don't need their temples as much. Uh, Selesnia doesn't really focus on curving out as much. So I, I'm really glad there's the Selesnia temple also. Um, but I think these are going to be like the more higher impact temples. Uh, Field of Ruin. This, you know, just left the format. It's coming back. I think that this is Field of Ruin's probably the most important in uh, monocolor decks. There's without Field of the Dead, it's not like... I don't know if Field of Ruin is going to have like a huge impact on the format, but maybe if you're playing like a monocolor aggro deck, maybe you can stock up on a bunch of Field of Ruins and punish like an, an Esper player that's not playing very many basics or something like that. But probably everybody, everybody's probably going to be playing basics. Most everybody has like a good amount of basics in, in standard right now. Um, but this art, this art on uh, Field of Ruin is awesome. Yeah, I really like this art, like this purple art here. Um, it looks really cool. Uh, I don't know if it's a reference to Field of the Dead. I don't know. But it looks really cool. Um, it is castle hate. Yeah, you do get to destroy castles. Um, because of castles, people are pay playing more basic lands, though, because of castles. So that part's worse. But castles are castles can kind of take over. And so, yeah, Field of Ruin destroying castles. Like, blue-white control is a deck that kind of relies on the white castle and blue castle. And so having field of ruin against blue white control is really nice. Another card, the blue white control is probably going to rely on is this labyrinth. This labyrinth is awesome. I like this card a lot. Well, check that. Sorry. No, I don't like this card a lot, but I think this card is very good. Labyrinth of Scophos. Um, you know, it's a colorless land and then pay for tap, remove target attacking or blocking creature from combat. Late game, it's going to be really hard to grind out like a blue-white control deck in the late game if they just have access to this, like when it's very, very late and they have, you know, like 10 mana and everything and they can just start start using this. 
even like Simic ramp, like like how we've talked about like how it's really easy for Simic to ramp and play a lot of extra lands. And if they're just playing extra lands, maybe they could just play a bunch of labyrinths and then just start making it really difficult for you to kill them. Uh, five is a lot. You can kind of think of this is you can kind of think of like Castle Ardenvale. It's the same. It's just like Castle Ardenvale, where Castle Ardenvale makes a one one. It's like Castle Ardenvale, like chump blocking. It's basically like letting Castle Ardenvale chump block anything. You know, it chump blocks questing beast. It chump blocks any flyer. Um, it chump blocks. It chump blocks completely a creature with Ember Cleave. You know, like you know, like they're like, all right, Ember Cleave my attacker, and you're like, all right, we'll just remove it from combat. Um, so you can kind of think of it like that. Like instead of Castle making just a one one, it it makes something that completely chump blocks anything. Um, I mean, you remove questing beasts from combat, right? So, like, that's, so, yeah. Yeah, so, obviously, yeah, obviously, you know, I mean, it just completely cancels it out. So, like, yeah, like, those creatures don't have lifelink anymore or anything like that, but that's what I'm saying, is it, it, it completely cancels out, like, that, that creature. Okay, um, so that's how you can kind of feel... That's how you can kind of think of Labyrinth of Scophos. That's a really, really powerful effect. And it's a, so Labyrinth is a very good card. Um, it's not legendary either. You can play multiple of them. And yes, it's a lot of mana, but we're talking about late game stuff. Um, sometimes you kind of just need to do it early on too, like while you're looking for your wrath. And you can, if they only have like one, if they have like one, one creature in play and you have five mana, you have a wrath, you can just start labyrinthing that creature and wait for them to play another creature. And then you wrath. Uh, maybe they have, you know, like two creatures, but one of them's like a 1-1 a one, one creature, and then the other one's going to do a lot of damage. Same thing. You know, you're like, well, instead of playing my Wrath, I'll just Labyrinth and go ahead. You're going to have to play another creature, because otherwise we'll just sit back and Labyrinth all day while I'm playing my land drops, because I'm like this really uh, land-heavy control deck. Um, but yeah, so you can... You can uh, uh, if you remove a blocking creature from combat, does the camp does the damage go through? So yeah, the creature. Okay, so if you remove a blocking creature from co combat, does the attacking damage go through? It does if they have trample. So if they if if you have a creature with trample, they block with something else. Then you remove their blocking creature. Then your trample creature has damage go through. Um. One thing, how you could use this on a blocking creature uh, for for your creatures, you can you could have like uh, let's say let's say they attack with a questing beast, okay? You block with Atrios Oracle of Half Truths because it's a three two, but obviously your Atrios is going to die. Because this is turn five. Like, you played Atrios on four mana. This is now you have five mana. You block with your Atrios. Before damage, you can then remove your blocking creature from combat. Oh, it doesn't flicker them, though. Because it doesn't exile them, then return them to the battlefield. So never mind. You don't get any ETB effects again. It just removes them from combat. Never mind. Never mind. You don't get any ETB effects again. Right. It just removes. Okay. Well, anyway, you can do that, too. So you can... I mean, you might as well have just done that to the Questing Beast in the first place. Uh, but anyway, uh, there we go. Unknown, sh unknown shores is not really playable. Um, and we have some pretty sweet basic lands, which I guess aren't going to be on arena except for four gems. Like, I guess they're not like the regular basic lands. Um, but yeah, if, if they have an attacker with hex proof that that can definitely help. Good call. Yep. You can just block it and remove your blocker, um, against creatures with hex proof. Or, <clears throat> yeah, because, you know, like, they could have, like, Gruul Spellbreaker that has Embercleave, and they're like, ha, my Gruul Spellbreaker has Embercleave, and it's Hexproof. You can't do anything about it. And you're like, well, I'll just block it. No, that still won't work, because it has Trample. So the Trample, that doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway. But yeah. Yep, these basics look pretty sick. Like, we're, we're definitely probably going to be playing with these basics. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um... Labyrinth is amazing with the white creature that gives indestructible. Yeah, because you, you can attack and attack with both of them, and then you remove your attacker from combat. That can work. 
Um, Athreos, the Shrouded Veil, isn't really in here. It, I guess it's not part of the set. Um, but Athreos... Uh, um, I don't know what Athreos like six mana and does some stuff. We're probably gonna play some Athreos. I'll, I'll go with that. I don't Athreos cost six mana, so probably won't see a ton of standard play. But us on stream will play Athreos. So there you go. It it does something. I don't remember what it does. Uh, what would I say is the best card in the set? Um. I'm not sure. Yeah, I know it's the buy a box card. Um, I kind of like... This is just the card that comes to my mind. The first card that comes... Oh, I forgot. There's a bunch of awesome black cards. I don't know. I kind of feel like... Where is this card? Tectonic Giant. I kind of feel like this card is is really good. I kind of feel like this may be it. Tectonic Giant here. Um, yeah, I really like Tectonic Giant. Um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, so as far as like as far as like the best card in each color, Tectonic Giant. I had there a uh, black. I think I just said um, either you know it's either Shepherd. Or Grey Merchant? I don't remember what I said. It was either Grey Merchant, Shepherd, or Woe Strider. And I don't remember which one I said for black. But, um, but yeah, this Nightmare Shepherd is really cool. White, I had Elspeth. Um, white was not spectacular. Blue had Thrix. That was definitely the best card in blue. Also not a very good color. Green has just like... A variety of pretty busted stuff. Yeah, I think I I had Dryad as the best card in green. Um, but there's some other really good cards in green, and then multicolor. I guess we had Uro here as the best card in multicolor. Um, so yeah, I don't know. They're the actual best card out of all those but you know like the, those are like the ones that we're kind of looking at there um <laughs> yeah uh this yeah this card's not this card's not terrible dream trawler you know six man is is pretty tough but yeah it's i i like i like your um i like your your saying there uh i said i feel like it's probably unplayable a worse chromium but i want it to be good because i like it I think it could be a, a cyborg card against aggro. I think that's mostly. I think that's like the best upside that it has: a cyborg card against against uh, aggro. Okay, but anyway, so there we go. There's there's our complete set review. Uh, those y'all just come joining in. Um, you know, if you can you can see all of the grades through that Google document that Anna Volver had there. But also check out all the other colors, white, blue, black, red, and green. They're all already done. They're up on YouTube channel right now. I'll put a link to the YouTube channel. It's just, I guess I had I had uh, caps lock on. But it's just uh, youtube.com slash ToddStevensMTG. They're all up there. Those of y'all watched on YouTube, and I hope y'all in chat, let me know in the comments what cards am I underrating, what cards am I overrating, you know, like, what are your favorite cards in the set, you know, what do you think are like the best cards in the set. You know, Feel free to, to leave leave them on the comments so that you have you have the record of them so you know like later on you can be like see i i said this card was going to be great you didn't like it or i said this card wasn't going to be any good you said it was going to be great you know that kind of stuff leave those comments on youtube in each of the colors i hope you do that uh, the comments help share the videos also um and uh there we go yeah definitely you know hit the like buttons on them um and yeah we're thursday we're going to be getting theros beyond death in standard and we're going to start playing some sweet theros decks <laughs> all right that's it here though that was it um i hope you all enjoyed this long uh like nine hour process i'm gonna go eat some food now i'm gonna go warm up a pizza i'm gonna go make a frozen pizza to go eat but uh, thank you so much for watching. Hope you check out all the videos, like I said, and uh, I'll see you for the next one. So, take care.